Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is November 20, 1976, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 18. As I speak with you today, we are drawing ever closer to being swallowed up by the evils unleashed two generations ago by a tight network of Foundation trustees operating under a false cloak of philanthropy, supposedly for the benefit of others, they actually launched long-range programs designed to grab everything for themselves. Claiming to improve education in the cause of freedom, they actually began replacing education with indoctrination in the cause of collectivism. And while painting themselves as champions of peace, they have led the world into war after war on the road to their version of peace, that is, an all-powerful world government with themselves in control. Blinded by the insatiable greed for power, they could not see that they were opening Pandora's box, setting forces in motion that would ultimately prove impossible to control. Only recently, with disaster looming up fast, have the present-day successors to those original trustees begun awakening to this fact, too late to regain control. Now only the truth, spread far and wide, can avert total catastrophe. Two years ago, the United States of America plunged over the brink of a devastating economic collapse as the result of deliberate measures to create stagflation, as I described in my 1973 book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar. But the process was arrested part way down because other aspects of the master plan for world domination were slipping behind schedule. As I have related in detail in previous tapes, factors such as the still-concealed Fort Knox gold and plutonium scandals, reverses in the Middle East, Indira Gandhi's upset of the CIA in India, and other things have caused our unseen rulers enormous difficulties for over 18 months. But time is running out, and it is do or die for those who seek to enslave us. So now the United States has at last been pried loose from its temporary economic foothold, and we are falling slowly but helplessly like a dreamer in a nightmare toward the dreaded economic depression far below. Politically, the phantom election plan I revealed last month by which Nelson Rockefeller still plans to become America's chief executive is proceeding so far exactly as planned. Sixty-eight percent of the voting precincts nationwide had voting machines on November 2, 1976, and where they jammed all across the country, there was no provision for paper ballots. Thousands of ballots were lost in certain areas. The legality of thousands of others is being challenged and recounts are underway in some places. The net result, exactly as planned, was an extremely close popular vote and no landslide for anyone. President Gerald Ford thought he had the election in the bag, having been promised by Nelson Rockefeller that he would carry New York State. But the pained expression on Ford's face as his wife delivered his concession statement on November 3rd, was nothing compared to the shock that awaits Jimmy Carter if the plan now underway succeeds. Meanwhile, as the stage is being set for economic and political shocks in America, we drift ever closer to war and a declaration of national emergency that could spell the end of our freedoms and the dangerous intelligence gap created by Henry Kissinger continues. When I recorded monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 17 on October 26, last month, 
I mentioned that the Soviet Union already knew where our lost Phoenix missile was in the North Sea, but had not retrieved it. I had just learned of the missile's location and revealed it in that tape. On October 27 the following day, as soon as the tape was released, I also relayed it to military intelligence. That same day Navy spokesmen told the press that they still had not located the Phoenix, but using the information I relayed to them, the Navy found and retrieved the Phoenix missile on October 31. The United States Government would have you believe it is mere coincidence that they suddenly found the Phoenix after I revealed its location, even though the Navy had spent six weeks in a fruitless search prior to that. There are also those who would have you believe that General George S. Brown, the top military officer in the United States, met with me for more than an hour on September 16, 1976, in his Pentagon office out of idle curiosity. And especially there are many who want you to believe there will be no reason for the Soviet Union to do as I have charged planting underwater launched nuclear missiles within our own territorial waters. But nothing, my friends, could be further from the truth. What the Soviet Union has done and is doing is completely logical and to be expected if we look at it from their point of view. As Mrs. Margaret Thatcher leader of the Conservative Party in England recently said, and I quote, The danger is our Western tendency to assume that other people will apply our own standards and values. When considering international matters, the important thing is not to look at other nations as if we were standing in their shoes, but as if they were standing in their shoes." Unquote. If you depend, as most Americans do, on the controlled major media for your understanding of the world, you will never learn to think this way, nor can you hope to grasp the real issues that govern military survival. Yet such understanding is essential if we are to see how to correct our dangerous situation. One organization which, in my opinion, does do an excellent job of clarifying matters of defense and national security is the American Security Council, located at Boston, Virginia. Their ZIP is 22713. I recommend the Council as an excellent source of information for every concerned American. To help in understanding the threat we now face and how we got into such a position, I will discuss the following three topics today. Topic No. 1, the mushrooming debate over Soviet military power. Topic No. 2, why the Soviet Union wants nuclear p war. And Topic No. 3, how governmental and press secrecy are destroying our chances for peace. Topic No. 1. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger has said over and over again for nearly a decade, quote, detente or nuclear holocaust. There is no third way, unquote. With this in mind, public discussion of American-Soviet relations has focused for years on the alleged happy fruits of detente the growing thaw between East and West, and so forth. But lately there has been an ominous change. President Ford dropped the word detente from his active vocabulary, and mounting the concern over the ragged condition of NATO forces has been expressed increasingly by European and American leaders. Just last week two so-called prestigious groups burst upon the public scene to churn up controversy over the issues of mounting Soviet military power. First on November 11 came the Committee for the Present Danger, 
urging presumed President-elect Carter to increase military spending instead of decreasing it as promised during the election campaign. Then three days later, a study group financed by the Rockefeller Foundation proposed the opposite, that we undertake joint military reductions with the Soviet Union, perhaps initiating the process with selected unilateral reductions of our own. And the warnings continue. Just three days ago, a representative of Boeing Aerospace Company testified before Congress that in case of nuclear war, 98 percent of the Soviet population would survive because of the elaborate civil defense precautions being taken there. By contrast, of course, the United States has no civil defense program worthy of the name. Obviously, detente is fading from the official scene rapidly. According to the Kissinger formula, that means nuclear holocaust is on its way. But where did he get that formula? The word detente is just another word for what was termed peaceful coexistence in the early 60s. And the Kissinger formula first emerged in October 1959 in the form, quote, peaceful coexistence or nuclear holocaust there is no third way." Unquote. But the speaker then was not Henry Kissinger. It was Nikita Khrushchev. The peaceful coexistence idea, which later became so-called détente, began 20 years ago when Khrushchev announced a major new Soviet policy line, namely that war with the West was not inevitable after all contrary to the teachings of Lenin. Instead, the nuclear age had made peaceful coexistence necessary. To most Westerners, this sounded like live and let live. But to the Soviet Union, it meant only the avoidance of a war which could destroy the Soviet Union. It was all right to continue to break off chunks of the free world by intrigue, subversion, and so-called wars of national liberation, such as those which have occurred in Vietnam, Angola, and elsewhere. The Soviet Union concentrated on selling the idea of peaceful coexistence for five years, from 1956 to 1961, ably assisted by their allies here in the United States. Then. In 1961, a major new phase began as John F. Kennedy became President of the United States. For decades, the state socialists who run the Soviet Union had been in alliance with and supported by the corporate socialists whose control over the United States was growing ever more complete. Now at long last. The time was ripe to launch their well-orchestrated joint program that was to lead to complete dictatorial control of the United States by the corporate socialists, Soviet conquest of vast areas of the world piecemeal with corporate socialist assistance, and finally joint domination of the entire world by the Rockefeller Soviet Alliance. The basic idea of the program was for the strength and resolve of the United States to be undermined and sapped while the Soviet Union will be enabled to forge ahead into unprecedented world power. Communism would be made appear to be the wave of the future, while American morale and faith in our free system of government would be steadily eroded. Finally, according to plan, the United States would be in the process of increasing encirclement and vulnerability, more and more countries becoming Soviet satellites with the unseen help of American corporate socialists who would share in the spoils. Economic disaster, 
military vulnerability, and the collapse of our own self-confidence would, according to plan, open the door for dictatorship here in America. The single most critical step in this long-range plan began to be taken in 1961. The progressive shut-off of critical research and development programs for a future military technology. If research uncovers a basic new concept at a given point in time, it will ordinarily be 5 to 15 years before it can be translated into a new operational technology. In between, there must be development, experimentation, evaluation, and full-scale production programs. By the same token, of research, if research and development are cut off at some point five to fifteen years later, you will not have the new technology available that would otherwise have come into being. Early justifications for the dwindling R&D program were based on fond new hopes for disarmament in connection with the new Soviet stance in favor of peaceful coexistence. Later. As the conflict in Vietnam grew into a major war, it became easier to leave important R&D items out of the already swollen defense budget. Another key ingredient in the overall plan was to be the use of Cuban troops as proxies in Soviet so-called wars of national liberation in Latin America and elsewhere. The Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961 a few short months after Kennedy took office could have produced a serious setback for the Rockefeller Soviet plans for overthrow of numerous governments, so Kennedy's advisors carefully steered him away from making the invasion a success. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union constructed long-range plans to take advantage of the American disadvantage in military technology that was being arranged to occur in the mid-1970s. While our R&D began to decline, theirs accelerated. By knowing exactly what to expect, the Soviet Union was able to target its military development toward achievement of a dominant position 15 years later, and that time has now arrived. In 1962, however, a gamble by Nikita Khrushchev almost caused the whole plan to come apart. For more than a year, a prominent United States Senator, Kenneth Keating, had been sounding warnings that offensive nuclear missiles were being placed in Cuba by the Soviet Union, but his charges were denied by the Administration, just as my charges about Soviet underwater missiles are being plausibly denied now. But President Kennedy finally decided to look into it himself personally instead of accepting blind assurances that there was nothing to it from his advisors. He found out that the charges were true and the Cuban Missile Crisis was upon us. The Cuban Missile Crisis led to the elimination from the scene of both Kennedy and Khrushchev. First as I revealed in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 3 for August 1975, President Kennedy was murdered because he was becoming increasingly dangerous to the Rockefeller Soviet alliance. He had come into office lacking any real grasp of the realities of international politics, but he was learning, and learning fast. It was clearly only a matter of time before he would get around to reversing the cutoff of our critical R&D programs. Already he was initiating steps intended to turn off our involvement in Vietnam. Khrushchev, for his part, took longer to oust since his power had to be chipped away carefully by his enemies in the Kremlin, but finally he was removed for jeopardizing the long-range plan of conquest with a dangerous gamble that failed. Looking ahead toward the increasing opportunities that would present themselves for the Soviet Union to benefit at America's expense. The Institute of the United States of America was founded early in the 1960s in Moscow. This Institute, whose purpose is to study the vulnerabilities of the United States 
was founded with the help of financing from the Rockefeller Foundation. Once the Oval Office was inhabited by Lyndon Johnson, the grand plan proceeded onward without further difficulty. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara played an especially important role in several ways. The period during which he served, from 1961 to 1968, was one in which research and development carried out prior to the R&D cutoff would potentially be continuing to bear fruit. But McNamara, doing the bidding of those who had placed him in that position, succeeded in causing the cancellation of important advanced weapons programs, decommissioning of many defense installations, physical scrapping of huge quantities of defense materiel, and costly concentration of effort on ill-fated programs such as the F-111 multipurpose Air Force Navy fighter. He also championed the impressive sounding theory of warfare called Measured Response, which guaranteed the escalation of Vietnam into a major war by preventing clear-cut, decisive wins in battle. As his reward for such valuable service, McNamara was made President of the World Bank. Can you imagine? With the inauguration of President Richard M. Nixon on January 20, 1969, the Kissinger era of foreign policy emerged in full bloom. Kissinger had been an influential voice in government since the early 60s thanks to his association with Nelson Rockefeller that began in 1955. Now he became one of the most important Rockefeller Soviet agents in the United States Government. Following the outlines of the Long Range Plan, he became known as the architect of so-called détente, repeating Khrushchev's old formula, peaceful coexistence or nuclear holocaust, almost verbatim. In 1972, détente entered a new phase. The SALT I agreement was signed in Moscow by President Nixon in May of that year. Meanwhile the same year, the Soviet Union launched the massive drive in civil defense that has lately started attracting attention. The Soviet Union could see that the long-awaited opportunity to pull ahead of the United States was fast approaching. That same year, 1972, saw the expansion of so-called détente to Red China. Kissinger also played a central role in this development, but far from promoting real peace, Kissinger was undoing a golden opportunity for freedom for a quarter of the world's people and possibly peace for the entire world. What I am about to tell you is top secret, and I am revealing it for the very first time. Some years ago, an international entrepreneur whom I will call Smith was in the act of selling a large European bank when he was approached by a Chinese on a business venture involving a retired Chinese general whom I will call Li. Li had known both Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong very well during earlier revolutionary days and was still closely associated with six regional military chieftains in Red China who were all genuinely anti-Soviet in every way. Moreover, after the turmoil that took place in Red China in 1957 and later, these Chinese military chieftains became completely disenchanted and disgusted with Mao's program of using young hoodlums to terrorize and murder all suspected opposition to his dictatorial and oppressive programs. Mao's euphemistic term, cultural revolution, for these cutthroat methods of bending the people to his will did not impress them. They contacted Lee and queried him as to the possibility of getting American support in case they should decide to overthrow Mao and establish a republic using the customary parliamentary form of government. Those who preferred the security of socialism would be allowed to live in communes 
but the government would foster a free market system for the country as a whole. General Lee arranged to the United States Department of State to send envoys through the bamboo curtain to make the necessary arrangements, but someone in the State Department leaked the information to Red Chinese officials, and all of the envoys were quickly apprehended and put to death. Nevertheless, General Lee persisted. He asked Mr. Smith if he could arrange for broadcasting equipment to inform all of Red China what was taking place, why the military deemed it necessary to overturn Mao, and what form of government would be established. Smith agreed to contact certain top officials in the United States Government close to the President. However, General Lee emphasized that he must circumvent Henry Kissinger and get the ear of Mr. Nixon only, since Lee did not trust Kissinger nor anyone else in the State Department. The contacts were made, but unfortunately a member of another agency heard of the plan and briefed President Nixon about it in front of Kissinger. Almost immediately arrangements were made for Kissinger to visit China to meet secretly with Mao. This meeting took place, and at the meeting Kissinger informed Mao that he would be overthrown by a military coup unless Mao's regime chose to cooperate with those who held the real power in the United States. To sweeten the deal for Mao, certain secret agreements were made concerning the future course of American relationships with the Republic of China on Taiwan. The outgrowth of the meeting was ping-pong diplomacy. The Nixon summit trip to Peking in February 1972 a so-called detente between Red China and the United States. In return, Mao Zedong's iron-handed dictatorship over Red China was rendered secure once again. Red China would thus continue to be a controllable threat to the Soviet Union. With any real threat to the Soviet Union from the direction of Red China taken care of, the Rockefeller Soviet plan continued. Last year the Helsinki Accord gave the Soviet Union essentially what she had wanted for 20 years, a ratification of her conquests in Eastern Europe. By thus signaling to the imprisoned countries behind the Iron Curtain that we consider them to be within the Soviet sphere, we reduce any tendency they might have to revolt in case of war. The Soviet western flank is thus made far more secure than before. In the past several years countries have been falling into the Soviet orbit at a quickening pace with their domination shared secretly by their corporate socialist allies here in America. At the same time, the declining military might of the United States and the fast increasing threat from the Soviet Union has finally become too obvious to hide any longer. This stage, too, was foreseen and planned. All of the economic, political, and military factors are intended to lead to a declaration of national emergency here in America, dictatorship, and war. But as it turned out, there is a terrible joker in the deck that has been dealt by the Rockefeller Empire in its hidden collaboration with the Soviet Union. The war to come, Nuclear War I, waged primarily on American soil, was supposed to be neatly limited and controlled with a nuclear safe zone set aside for the Soviet allies here in America, as I revealed in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 12 last May. But the Soviet Union has for months been maneuvering to carry out a double-cross at this critical stage in America's increasing vulnerability. They want to seize all the marbles for themselves. Topic No. 2. For many years American strategic defense strategy has been based on a concept called Mutual Assured Destruction, or MAD, M-A-D. The idea here is that should either the Soviet Union or the United States launch a nuclear attack on the other, 
the victim of the attack would be able to destroy the attacker in return. In this concept, furthermore, the targets are cities, not military targets such as enemy missile installations. An ICBM attack under these conditions would have only one basic purpose, to kill tens of millions of innocent civilians. This is the so-called balance of terror we often hear about. In World War II, Hitler used V-1 buzz bombs and V-2 missiles in exactly this way against the civilian population of England instead of against military targets, thinking to terrorize England into submission. But as we all know, it didn't work. The British learned to dig into bomb shelters, absorb the civilian deaths and damage, and meanwhile redoubled their efforts at military installations to strike back at Hitler in more important ways. The MAD Mutual Terror Defense Strategy is nothing more than a nuclear age version of the very technique that was proven to be useless over 30 years ago. We've all heard countless times, quote, the last thing the Soviet Union would ever want is a nuclear exchange with the United States, unquote. This comforting statement tends to make one accept the foolish mad defense doctrine if it is to be believed, but it is wrong. The announcement by Nikita Khrushchev in 1956 that all-out war was not inevitable with the West after all appeared to be a renunciation of a basic Leninist principle, but it was not. It was simply the beginning of an elaborate 20-year ploy to make us lower our guard so that when the inevitable all-out conflict did come, the Soviet Union would be in a position to win. History is repeating itself. In the night, late 1930s, many people made the mistake of believing that Hitler did not actually want war but was willing to risk it in order to obtain concessions. So the concessions were made with the idea that this would prevent war. Only too late was it realized that Hitler was determined to have a war one way or another. In the past, the Soviet Union has been notably cautious when skirting the fringes of a possible nuclear war, but that was while she was still at a disadvantage militarily. Now for the first time the Soviets are emerging into a totally new situation in which their military power is second to none. With the rapid collapse of free governments now occurring around the globe, the overall correlation of forces, as they call it, is shifting rapidly in favor of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is now number one in military power, while the United States is number two a situation that has never existed before. The time is now ripe for the Soviets to press their advantage in an effort to seize control of the world. The standing threat from Red China is often mentioned hopefully as a major factor tending to offset any Soviet ideas of waging major war against us, but this too is in error. The Soviet fear of Red China far from acting as a break, is spurring them on. Right now Red China is leaning on the United States, but should the United States be knocked out of action by a Soviet hammer blow before China could take advantage of the situation, China would then be isolated. Red China would then have no choice but to patch things up with the Soviet Union and cooperate at least on pragmatic matters. Of course, with the United States defeated and the two Communist superpowers joining forces once again, the fate of the rest of the world would no longer be in question. Thus, as I stated in monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 15, if we fall, the world falls, and that is the basis of Soviet strategy. Thus the Soviet Union does want nuclear war with the United States, provided the Soviet Union is prepared to survive with losses limited to acceptable levels, and provided the United States can be destroyed as a military rival in the process. 
the Soviet rulers emphatically do not think of nuclear war as something that could only happen as the unwanted result of a confrontation, even though this is how we tend to think of it. To them, war, including nuclear war, is a tool of conquest to be used whenever it is advantageous to do so. People have asked the question, why would the Soviet Union plant underwater missiles in our waters when they already have ICBMs, missile launching submarines, and so forth? Even some officials who know about the Soviet missiles raise this question in various forms as a smokescreen to create doubt. But once you understand the basic Soviet viewpoint I have described, the reasons for the planting of underwater missiles become far easier to grasp. To begin with, the underwater missiles constitute a first-strike capability for the Soviet Union. That is, they are concentrated on military targets. Specifically, they are intended to wipe out our naval bases, major ports, and a good fraction of our naval fleet in one sudden surprise blow without advance warning. This type of first strike is quite different from those usually discussed, but would be extremely effective. Consider the choice faced by an American President immediately after such a sudden strike by the Soviet Union by means of its underwater missiles, followed by a Soviet ultimatum to surrender. True, the American naval forces at sea around the world at the time of the attack would be unaffected and our missile subs could give the Soviet Union an unpleasant pasting. Even our ICBMs might still be available to fire, but what then? First, the damage we could now inflict on the Soviet Union would be minimized by the mammoth civil defense preparations that have been underway in the Soviet Union for five years and more. If the President did choose to counterattack, Several million Soviet citizens would possibly die, and a small portion of the military and industrial facilities of the Soviet Union, not underground, would be destroyed. But the vast majority of the Soviet population would survive our counterattack, as would a large part of their military industrial complex. Now it would be their turn again. The price we would pay for disobeying the Soviet ultimatum would be awesome. A salvo of ICBMs, not the whole Soviet ICBM force, perhaps but a few hundred nonetheless, would rain down on the United States, hitting both military targets and big cities. Thanks to the well-named MAD defense strategy we have followed, we have no civil defense, and the carnage would be beyond imagination especially since Soviet nuclear warheads are many times more powerful than ours. As for our naval forces, attacks by Soviet anti-ship cruise missiles would rapidly take their toll, and the inability to return to port for fuel and more weapons would cause our Navy to wither away as a fighting force. It would only be a matter of time until our vital sea lanes of commerce were totally destroyed. The process might continue perhaps for some time, but the outcome would not be in doubt. The Soviet Union would be able to outlast us and outblast us once the initial crucial strike against our Navy was made with the underwater missiles. The secret of success of the Soviet plan is their use of a weapon system that would enable the first strike against our Navy to be a complete surprise with extremely reliable results. The greatest possible surprise, of course, would have been achieved if our Navy had never even known the missiles were there off our shores until the moment they were fired. That was the surprise element that my monthly AUDIO LETTERS No. 14 and 15 were intended to remove last summer. Another element of surprise has to do with the warning time if a missile is actually launched. With ICBMs, satellite surveillance can provide a warning time of 20 minutes or so, 
plenty of time to launch our own missiles in retaliation if the decision is made to do so. Submarine-launched ballistic missiles may cut the warning time to a few minutes, but in the case of the short-range underwater launch missiles, there is virtually no warning at all. Since they must travel only a short distance, and the time of flight is brief. By the time they are detected and our defenses alerted, they will be exploding over their targets. There is only one other kind of warning which is probably the most important of all, advanced warning of impending attack through intelligence channels and through reading the meaning of political tensions. Up to now, for example, NATO defense planning has assumed that any attack on Western Europe by the Soviet Union would be preceded by a warning of at least three weeks. And 35 years ago there were several advance warnings before the attack on Pearl Harbor, beginning a week or so ahead of time. But at that time these warnings were deliberately blocked at high levels of the United States Government because certain individuals wanted to ensure that the attack did occur. And now the chance of obtaining advance warning of impending attack is once again reduced thanks to the intelligence gap created by Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. When the Soviet Union decides the time is right to attack, they do not intend to telegraph their intentions in advance. In this regard, the underwater missiles lurking along our shores can be invaluable to them. Their ICBMs have too long a warning time and insufficient accuracy and reliability for the Soviet rulers to employ them with full confidence in a worldwide naval Pearl Harbor attack, such as I described in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 15. And if they chose to use their missile launching submarines for that purpose, closing into short range to produce short flight times for their missiles, they would risk alerting our Navy that something was up because of the peculiar deployment of their submarines. On top of that, a worldwide surprise attack of the kind contemplated by the Soviets depends for its success on a simultaneous strike everywhere. Not an easy thing to achieve with missiles launched by numerous submarines all over the world. But the underwater missiles are made to order for a surprise attack. They lurk unseen for days, weeks, or months until they are needed. Then when they are to be fired, the preparations for the attack can be made without any outward sign at all, deep inside a command post in the Soviet Union. To launch the attack itself, a signal need only be flashed worldwide from the command post. While the observable activities of the Soviet Union, military and otherwise, proceed in normal patterns, giving no hint of the impending attack. When the surprise attack plan of the Soviet Union is known, the question is no longer, why would they plant those underwater missiles? The question becomes, why wouldn't they do it? The Soviet Union is prepared to wage war with several times our own nuclear firepower. At the same time, they are prepared to survive such a war as a viable society with population losses of perhaps no more than 2 percent. That's around 5 million lives, and it is indeed very hard for you and me to imagine deliberately accepting such losses for a political purpose. But remember, the Soviet bosses think their way, not our way, and if they were to suffer losses that large, our own losses could be 50 to 100 million. Provided they have the ability to disable the United States Navy at the outset with the surprise attack they have planned, the Soviets believe they have little to lose and everything to gain now by their standards in a nuclear war, and that is why the Soviet Union wants nuclear war now. Topic No. 3. 
since early July 1976, shortwave radio communications worldwide have been disrupted by what one ham radio operator describes as, quote, a super enormous strong signal that sounds like a buzz saw, unquote. Not only hams have been affected, but maritime, aeronautical, and telecommunications channels have been rendered practically useless in some cases. The signal is a rasping sound that pulses ten times per second, originating from Soviet transmitters. The monitoring branch of the Federal Communications Commission has received a flood of complaints and has written four complaints to Moscow about it without any reply whatsoever. According to Robert Cutts, Chief of the FCC's International Operations Division, this silence from the Soviet Union is very unusual. Quote, Usually they have been very cooperative, unless there is something particularly unique about this situation." Unquote. Indeed there is something unique about these Soviet radio signals, my friends. They are transmissions between Moscow and Soviet submarines worldwide by means of the advanced communication system I mentioned in a recent monthly AUDIO letter. It is no accident that these signals first began early in July 1976. That was the month when I first revealed the existence of underwater missiles in American and Canadian territorial waters planted by the Soviets. It is also no accident that transmissions like this were first heard in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The government professes not to have any idea what these signals are all about but they know better. These signals are being used to maintain tight coordination of Soviet naval activities, especially submarine movements, in preparation for war. But one lie leads to another, and just as you are not being told about the Soviet underwater missiles that threaten your life and your freedom, you are not being told the true meaning of the Soviet buzzsaw signals. There are at least Thirteen transmitters broadcasting these powerful signals, located mostly in Soviet or Soviet-occupied territory. Transmitters are operated in Archangel, Leningrad, Moscow, Kiev, Odessa, Gdansk, the Bosphorus Straits, Rostov, Minsk, Warsaw, Prague, East Berlin, and of all places, Loch Ness in Scotland. The Loch Ness Transmitter is aboard a small submarine that entered the northeast end of Loch Ness by means of the canal that connects Loch Ness to Moray Firth. If there wasn't one before, there certainly is a Loch Ness Monster now, complements of the Soviet Union. These Soviet transmissions make use of a technique known as pulse modulation. Each of the ten pulses per second sounds like nothing more than a meaningless rasp to the ear, but in fact each pulse contains a superimposed signal in code. The possible codes are endless, and a computer is required both to create the coded pulses for transmissions and to decode them where they are received. Therefore, unless and until intelligence information becomes available on the details of the exact code, it is practically impossible to intercept and understand the Soviet messages to their subs. But matters even more blatant than the Soviet mysterious signals are being hidden from you. For example, do you know about the joint Soviet and Cuban naval and aviation maneuvers that took place from September 15 to September 23, 1976 in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico? These war games utilized not only the new Soviet submarine base at Cienfuegos Harbor, not far from the United States Naval Station at Guantanamo Bay, but also Mario and Havana, right across from Florida. These war exercises carried a clear threat for the Panama Canal, Puerto Rico, and our base at Guantanamo Bay, and in addition ranged all along our Gulf Coast as far west as Galveston, Texas. Yet our so-called Defense Department said not one word about it, and our sleeping press 
following the non-existent lead of our controlled major media, said nothing about it either. Since Red Friday, October 1, 1976, our military from General George S. Brown on down have been muzzled, ordered to flatly deny charges about Soviet missiles in our waters if pressed to comment on them. Meanwhile, top secret civil defense exercises are now underway here in Washington, D.C. and other sensitive areas for top government officials only, while the rest of our people are left in the dark, not only without protection, but without even any official warning that war could be imminent. But the last straw came in just the past several days, my friends. Last month I reported that immediately after the Red Friday capitulation by President Ford to, so to the Soviet demands advanced by Andrei Gromyko, Soviet submarines along our east and west coasts performed a chemical warfare experiment. Clouds of radioactive plutonium were released into our atmosphere to drift inward and contaminate the United States, while the United States Government cooperated by claiming that we were being plastered with radioactive fallout from a Chinese nuclear test ten days earlier. As I reported last month, we were spared major effects from that experimental plutonium release due to weather conditions that did not behave as predicted by the Soviets, but now they are poised to do it again. On Wednesday, November 17, a large Chinese atmospheric hydrogen bomb test was announced, and immediately we were inundated with announcements that the radioactive cloud would reach our west coast only three short days later, today, November 20, 1976. Last time they claimed that the Chinese cloud took ten days to cover the same distance, but that was because the Soviet subs were not ready at that time to use the Chinese blast as a cover for their chemical attack against us. This time they can hardly wait. As of noon yesterday, November 19, 18 Soviet submarines were deployed at even intervals along our west coast within about 35 miles of our shoreline. They are not missile launchers but are equipped specifically for the injection of plutonium into our air today. The Environmental Protection Agency EPA, is telling us not to fear the Chinese nuclear cloud alleged to be passing over our country, but is cooperating completely with the Soviet Union in providing a totally false cover for the Soviet radioactive plutonium attack on our country. In actual fact, the radioactivity created by the Chinese test itself has not yet gone beyond Red China's own borders. The media are reminding us how terrible swine flu might be, and we are also being told of the disappointingly low number of eligible Americans who are taking the free government swine flu shots. We are told that swine flu, if it breaks out, could spread like wildfire. And now certain persons in the United States Government are cooperating with the Soviet Union in an attack on our nation by means of radioactive plutonium, the effects of which can be mistaken for severe flu if intended dosages are achieved. My friends, the so-called mysterious signals from the Soviet Union stopped temporarily on November 2, but then on November 10 they started up again because Soviet war preparations were resuming. Since I talked with you last, 36 new missiles have been planted in our waters in addition to those I referred to last month. I have not given the locations of these to anyone, and for now I do not intend to do so. Now let me tell you why. On one hand there are those factions within the shell of a government left here in Washington who are actively cooperating with the Soviet Union. Some of these are outright Soviet agents. Others are part of the corporate socialist network that cooperates with the Soviets for mutual advantage at the expense of the rest of us. Some in this second group still do not believe that a Soviet double-cross has been underway for months 
in the form of the underwater missiles in our waters. On the other hand, there are many who are honestly trying to counter the Soviet underwater missile threat, acting within constraints imposed on them. Prior to October 1, missiles were being removed as they were planted by the Soviet Union, acting on information I was providing to General George S. Brown and to military intelligence. In this capacity, I have been acting as an information channel to go around the intelligence gap created by Henry Kissinger. But where is all this leading? What will happen if traitors in our midst continue to cover up the truth about the Soviet underwater missiles, and if patriots in our government cannot summon the courage to tell the truth regardless of the consequences? What is going to happen if that situation continues, my friends, is thermonuclear war and dictatorship here in America. Even if the United States Navy were to continue removing Soviet missiles as they are planted, which they have been ordered not to do since October 1, this would not prevent disaster. The Soviet Union is able to plant missiles far faster than we can remove them. So the information I have been relaying is really being used now for just one purpose, to enable our leaders to keep abreast of the chances of attack and to minimize those chances until they are ready to run and hide in the 96 underground cities of the Federal Relocation Arc to ride out the war. Then war can come, scorching the land and consuming our people. The top secret information provided me by my sources, often at the risk of their own lives, is not intended for the private use of cold-blooded traitors and spineless leaders in the American Government. It is intended to bring about exposure of the truth as the one and only thing that can prevent a war. If war comes, it will be a devastating surprise to most Americans. The perverse behavior of our public officials in misusing my information threatens to condemn millions of us to a nuclear holocaust. Therefore, it is only right that they condemn themselves at the same time. Without the missile locations I am now withholding, they too will be caught in the lightning surprise attack by the Soviet Union that threatens to engulf the rest of us. Millions of our lives apparently mean nothing at all to them compared to their service to the Soviet Union and their jobs and their pensions. But now their lives are at stake along with the rest of us. Only if the truth about the Soviet underwater missiles is exposed will I turn over the new information I have on which not only our lives, but theirs too, now depend. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.